I am very excited to be here today because we get to do something very unusual together for the next 45 minutes. We get to take games seriously. Now, most people don't take games seriously. We think of them as a way to pass the time or waste the time. But today, we're going to take games seriously as a platform for solving real problems, for crowdsourcing innovation, for engaging employees and customers in extreme scale collaboration. Now, there are a lot of reasons to take games seriously, but this is one of my favorites. About a year ago, humanity reached a new milestone, very important milestone. We now have one billion gamers on the planet. That's one billion people who spend at least one hour a day playing connected games online, on their phones, on a tablet, on a console. Now, these aren't necessarily the people you might think of when you think of gamers. 40% are women, and one in four are aged 50 years old or older. And with a scale like this, one billion people worldwide playing an hour a day, you start to see a lot of interesting economic impacts. For example, you may have seen the headlines last winter when one game, Call of Duty Modern Warfare, Modern Warfare 3, made $400 million in the first 24 hours of release and $1 billion in the first two weeks. Now, this is an interesting statistic because no entertainment product in the history of humanity has made that much money that quickly. We think about blockbusters, we think about Hollywood movies and Harry Potter books, nothing has ever made that much money that quickly. But the economic impact that I'm interested in exploring today isn't actually the financial economic impact. It actually is the engagement economy that we're going to talk about. Now, the engagement economy, we're going to look at the scale of people that we can reach through games. For example, through Angry Birds. They just reached a billion downloads, and they estimate that each download has reached more than one person because, you know, people share, they play the same game together. That makes Angry Birds the largest online community on the planet. More people than Facebook are part of the Angry Birds community. So think about that. That is an extraordinary accomplishment. One game has a bigger online community than Facebook. And when you have that many people engaged, you get some pretty interesting participation statistics. So we've already spent 325,000 years playing Angry Birds to avenge the theft of the bird's eggs. Have you guys contributed any of those years yet? I have, I have. Um, and that means 300 million minutes a day that we are spending playing this game. 300 million minutes a day. Maybe you're more of a hardcore gamer and not into casual games. Consider Call of Duty. The average player is spending 170 hours a year playing this one game. That is the equivalent of a full-time job for an entire month. These gamers are playing Call of Duty like it's their job. Why? Well, this is something that I look about a lot, being in the United States. We know that 71% of workers in our country are actively disengaged. Now, this means they show up at work and they just don't care about the job that they're doing. They don't feel like they understand the meaning or purpose behind their work, or they don't feel like their strengths are being engaged fully. They don't feel like they have a chance to be creative or to enjoy the work that they're asked to do. Now, Gallup estimates that this is costing, in the US, companies $300 billion annually in lost productivity. And that's just productivity. I mean, imagine the cost to innovation when people are showing up and they just don't care. And this is not only in the United States, obviously. This is a global epidemic. People don't understand the purpose of their work. They don't feel like they're participating in something bigger than themselves. They don't feel like they have the opportunity to do something extraordinary the way we do in our favorite games. Games create a kind of engagement that we crave, which is why we're spending as a planet seven billion hours a week playing these games, rising to the heroic occasion, going on these extraordinary collaborative adventures. 
That's what's up for grabs in the engagement economy. Now, the engagement economy is simply a way of measuring a new kind of resource. And that resource consists of a billion people who are available for online collaborative work. And they want to be wholeheartedly engaged with a tough challenge. It's just our job to figure out what kind of challenge we can give them. Just to give you an idea of how this might work, Clay Shirky is a researcher who worked with a researcher at IBM to calculate how long it took to create the entire Wikipedia, every article, every line of code to build the platform, but also every time anybody made a single edit for every article, the whole thing. They calculated that it took 100 million hours of online effort, people showing up and participating, 100 million hours. By comparison, that is just three weeks of what we're spending playing Angry Birds. That is just seven days of Call of Duty gameplay. It kind of makes you wonder, what if we spent some of that time contributing to real world problems or to building collective intelligence in the way that we have <clears throat> ah, it's back. <laughs> a little extra bonus challenge for me. What if we spent some of this time solving real problems and innovating together? Now, in order for that to work, in order for the engagement economy to really flourish, what we need are two things. First, we need mass participation. We know that crowdsourcing, collective intelligence, it requires diversity. We need men and women. We need all age groups. We need people from different intellectual backgrounds, different cultural backgrounds, right? We know collective intelligence only works if you have a diverse group of people. So we need lots and lots of people with diverse backgrounds. But they also need to have skills and abilities. You can't just have people show up and, and you know, do nothing. They have to have something they can contribute. So Wikipedia, the only skill you need is the ability to write and to know one thing about one thing. If you know one thing about one thing, you can make a contribution. So that's what we're looking for. Now, mass participation is not going to be a problem. The United States has been kind of a leading indicator here in terms of gamer demographics, and we're seeing these demographics play out globally. We have 99% of boys now under the age of 18 playing video games regularly, and 94% of girls now playing on average 13 hours a week for the boys and eight hours a week for the girls. Now this is good news because it means the gender divide is going away. There used to be a gender gap, a big gender gap in gaming, but now we know that virtually everyone under 18 knows how to game and likes to game, and that's a good thing. We also know that 92% of two-year-olds are playing games, so they're starting earlier than ever. I like this picture. I don't know if you can see the drool coming down from the mouth, but I think that perfectly sums up this generation's relationship to games and technology. It reminds me of this great quote, you know, it's inevitable, soon we'll all be gamers. We will be able to engage virtually anyone on the planet in a game, so we have the mass participation. But what about the skills and abilities? Well, I've been researching games and how they change how we think and act in real life for more than a decade. And if I had to say the number one skill and ability that gamers have, it's this list right here. We know that gamers have the ability to provoke extremely powerful, positive emotions whenever they sit down to play. It doesn't matter what they're feeling before they play. It doesn't matter how hard the game is or how many times they fail. They can provoke these 10 powerful emotions. They feel joy. They feel relief, usually from emotions like anxiety or frustration. They feel love because most people are playing cooperative games today rather than competitive. In fact, three out of every four gaming dollars are spent on cooperative games. Three out of every four gaming hours are spent working on the same problem, not competing against other gamers. And when we collaborate and cooperate together in these games, we develop social bond and support. So they feel love when they play with other gamers. They feel surprised as they discover and explore the world. They feel pride in what they're accomplishing. They feel curiosity about what will happen next or what the solution to a puzzle is. They feel excitement. They feel awe and wonder because they're inspired by the scale of the game or the heroic adventure of the game or the massively multiplayer community. They feel contentment. They wouldn't rather be spending their time any other way. 
and they feel creativity. The number one emotion that gamers feel is a sense of creative power, of agency. They can try something they've never tried before. They can think of a solution no one has ever thought of before. And they have this freedom to play and take risks and experiment and learn from mistakes and try something new. Now imagine if you could bring these 10 positive emotions to real work. You wouldn't have 71% of people showing up at the workplace actively disengaged. What if you could bring these 10 emotions to your customers so that every time they interacted with your organization or with your brand, they were feeling these 10 positive emotions? That's the potential power of games, to bring that to real work, to bring that to real life interactions. But maybe you're wondering, you know, why do I call these emotions a skill? Isn't it just an experience? I mean, sure, they feel good, but do they do good? I mean, what's the point of feeling these positive emotions? Well, what I want to show you today is some of my favorite scientific research on how these emotions are changing our real-life abilities, what we're capable of. And I've actually put up all of the science online. So if you want to dig in deeper, want to see for yourself exactly what I'm talking about, all you have to do is remember, show me the science. I'll give you the URL at the end of this talk. But if you want to dig in and learn more, we're going to look at a bunch of studies. You can go see the original research yourself. So just remember, show me the science. So here's some of my favorite findings from the past couple of years. First of all, we know that kids who play video games test higher in terms of creativity than kids who spend less time playing video games. So there's a creativity test called the Torrance Test of Creativity. It has you drawing pictures, it has you making up stories. This test has been validated for more than 40 years to accurately predict success, future career success. Will you be seen as an innovator? Will you be valued or recognized for creativity in your career? You can actually take scores from this test from kids and accurately predict and map career success in terms of creativity and innovation. And they found that kids who spend more time playing video games score 23% higher on this test. Now, I think this is interesting because the number one emotion that gamers say they feel is creativity. And now we have some scientific evidence to show that they're not just feeling creative, they're actually becoming more creative. They're actually increasing the skill of creativity. Now, we know from industry research that gamers spend 80% of the time failing. So that means four out of five times they don't succeed in their mission. They don't finish the quest. They don't level up. They don't get the score that they wanted. Now, compare this to real life. I would wager that almost none of us in this room spend 80% of the time failing at anything on a regular basis. If we did, we would just find something else to do. In real life, we don't like to fail. We're afraid of failure, or we avoid it. Gamers embrace failure. They could do anything in their free time. Instead, they sign up to fail again and again and again. This is very unusual, the ability to stay determined and motivated in the face of failure. This is a real skill that gamers are developing. Now, Nature Journal, a peer-reviewed scientific journal, did a roundup recently of neuroscience research on gaming, how it's changing how we think and act in real life. And I just wanted to share three of my favorite findings here. The first is that attention deficit and hyperactivity disorder, ADHD, the symptoms seem to go away for kids and young adults when they're playing their favorite games. Now, with attention deficit, you're not supposed to be able to stay focused and attentive. You're not supposed to be able to set long-term goals and really follow through. But for gamers, when they're engaged in a game that they enjoy, the disability goes away, and instead, they have ability. They can stay very focused and attentive. They can set goals and keep playing the game for hours or days, and in some cases, even weeks it takes to complete what you're trying to accomplish in a game. The gamers have this ability, even if they've been diagnosed with ADHD. There's something about the feedback system and the reward system that changes our brains and makes us able to stay focused and attentive and very goal-oriented. We also know from the research that social gamers are more likely to help others in real life. If you have played a game with somebody, particularly cooperative games, you will spend three times as much time and energy in the following week helping that person in real life, helping them 
with a chore, helping them with homework, helping them achieve something that they're interested in. Three times as much time and effort to help somebody in real life just from playing a game with them, from as little as 30 minutes of gameplay. So we're actually more likely to help in real life after we've helped in a game. That's really interesting. We also know it works the other way. Research has shown that kids who frequently play video games with their parents are more likely to ask their parents for help with a real world problem. They see their parents as a potential ally, somebody who can work with them to solve the problem. Finally, from this, this roundup, we're seeing that gamers with autism are showing increased social intelligence when they spend a lot of time playing games with people they know in real life, friends and family. The social intelligence is of a very particular kind. It has to do with the ability to understand someone else's goals and what they're trying to communicate and to work together um, in your ability to express your goals and what you're trying to accomplish. So this is very important for collaboration. I mean, it's important for everybody, but particularly for people with autism who have a difficulty understanding other people's emotions and motivations or expressing their own. The ability to transcend that by playing games, by something as simple as playing games is quite profound. Now this slide is interesting. Um, I found out about this research because I was contacted uh, by the United States Army by their mental health assessment team. They wanted help understanding this kind of strange finding. They, they hadn't set out to study games. They set out to study stress um, in, in active soldiers and soldiers returning home. And they were looking at the rates of suicide, of domestic violence, and of post-traumatic stress disorder. They wanted to see what soldiers were doing to try to deal with the stress and what was the most protective or helpful. So this grid, this chart here, the lower you are, the better you are. That's the lowest rate of any of these psychological incidents. And you can see here the activity that seemed to provide the most benefit, the most sort of protective or preventative benefit, was playing video games for three to four hours a day, usually war games like Call of Duty or Halo. Now, this was very surprising to the Army, and they were looking at things like music and using Facebook to connect with friends and family, reading, working out. But video games, three to four hours a day, dramatically lowered incidents of post-traumatic stress disorder, suicidal ideation, anxiety, depression. Pretty interesting stuff. The last research has to do with happiness. In clinical trials, casual games are now outperforming pharmaceuticals for treating anxiety and depression. So it's actually more beneficial to play online games, according to these clinical trials, for 30 minutes a day than to take a pharmaceutical to treat anxiety and depression. There are long-term impacts on mood. If you look at all this research, what it adds up to is a kind of resilience. It's the ability to stay strong in the face of challenge, the ability to come together with others to tackle a problem more successfully, right? We're seeing this kind of mental resilience, the ability to stay focused and have willpower and follow through to get to your goal. We're seeing an emotional resilience that we don't get anxious or frustrated or depressed when we're facing a tough challenge, but that we stay positive and that we stay engaged. We're seeing social resilience, the ability to reach out to others for help, the ability to understand what's motivating other people. Now, these different types of resilience, they remind me of this, this great saying about games. The opposite of play isn't work. It's depression, right? Now, think about the ability to transcend that kind of pessimism that we get in the face of tough challenges, that feeling like we just can't do it or that we want to opt out. When we sit down to play a game, we seem to provoke ways of thinking and ways of feeling that make us not give up and, and are able to unleash this kind of wholehearted engagement with really tough stuff. Now, I could talk about this forever, but sometimes faces and pictures are better. So I wanted to show you faces of gamers while they're playing their favorite games to just kind of capture this kind of resilience, the ability to stay wholeheartedly engaged with very tough work. I mean, here's the face of a gamer. By the way, you guys understand, right? They set up a camera in front of gamers while they were playing, so you can see them right in the moment. And you can see here, this guy is relishing some very difficult work, right? 
This is the face of resilience in gaming, right? She has a kind of fierce determination. We see faces like this, sort of perseverance and grit. I mean, this doesn't look like fun, but we know it must be fun because he's playing. Faces like this, where we kind of lose track of time. We find ourselves in a state of flow. We could play forever. Now, this guy I like because if you didn't know that he was playing a game, you would be pretty worried about him, I think. Um, the nostrils are flared, the pupils are dilated. I mean, he's clearly about to fail, but that's okay because gamers fail 80% of the time. And when we're willing to keep failing, we get to that kind of epic win outcome, to success that was greater than we thought was possible. So I like to think of this guy as like, the before picture for an epic win, and this guy is the after picture, right? He sort of shocks and, and amazes himself with what he was capable of achieving. So imagine these faces on people every day when they show up and work. Or imagine these faces on people every time they engage with your organization or brand. I think of these faces as being super empowered, hopeful individuals people who have trained their brains, trained themselves to be optimistic, to persevere, to not give up. And now, this is really exciting, we're just starting to see that it goes beyond the facial expressions. We can actually measure this optimism and perseverance in the brain. We can use fMRI technology to actually see the neurological activity that's behind this super empowered, hopeful individual. So I want to show you some of that research real quick. Now, this research was done by game designers who actually made a game to help young people beat cancer. This game was called Remission. They actually tested it in clinical trials, and they proved that young people who played this game for, on average, at least two hours were better able to fight cancer in real life for over a period of years. Now, here is the actual results. They found what was happening is that kids who played this game had much better chemotherapy adherence. So young people with cancer, they often have to take chemotherapy drugs for up to three years. And we know from the entire body of medical research that 80% of cancer that returns, it returns when chemotherapy doses have been missed. If you don't miss a chemotherapy dose, you have a much higher chance of beating the disease. But you have to not miss a dose for three years, which is very hard. You have to be very consistent, very focused. You have to not give up, even in the face of terrible side effects, over a period of three years. And they found that playing this game for just a couple of hours could actually change that behavior over the course of years. And not just because the gamers were saying that they did a better job of taking the chemotherapy. They actually measured the levels of the chemotherapy in the bloodstream, and the levels were 20% higher for kids who played this video game, 20% more cancer-fighting drugs in the body if they played this video game than if they hadn't. So this is pretty remarkable. Now, the, the people who made this video game wanted to understand how is it possible that playing a game for two hours can actually help you beat a disease as tough as cancer. So they did more research. They actually put gamers in fMRI machines to look at what was happening in the brain. So you see two different people here in the fMRI machine. The active case is somebody playing Remission, the video game, the cancer-beating video game. The one that looks really blank they're watching the video game. So they're not just lying there. They're actually engaged. They're watching all of the cool graphics and the sound effects, but they're not playing. And this is really interesting because it shows that the most important part of video games is not the media. It's not what it looks like. It's not what it sounds like. It's the engagement, the interaction. And when they looked at what was being lit up by the interactive play, they found two big differences. The first big difference was in the reward circuitry. You can see it here, the caudate and the thalamus. Now, we know that when these areas of the brain are really lit up, people do not give up. People are extremely goal-oriented. They are highly motivated. They will do whatever it takes to get what it is that they want. Now, what's interesting is that this region of the brain was lighting up in gamers not when they were winning, not when they got more points, not when they succeeded. It was lighting up after they took an action and they were waiting to see if it would work. So maybe I aim my chemotherapy gun at the cancer, I fire. In the moment that I'm waiting to see if I hit the target, 
that's when I get the reward. That's when I feel good. It's not feeling good from winning. This is really important. This is why gamers can fail 80% uh, of the time and still be happy. The reward comes from taking an effort and hoping that there's a positive outcome. Right? Fascinating. The other area of the brain that gets lit up is the hippocampus. Now, the hippocampus is associated with long-term learning. It's associated with memory. So when that area of the brain is lit up, it means you're committing something to your long-term memory. So what we can theorize from looking at this evidence is that gamers are training themselves to be super optimi optimistic, to be goal-oriented, to not give up. They are committing this version of themselves into a long-term habit. So this is what the brain of a super-empowered, hopeful individual looks like. And when I see this kind of research, I can't help but ask myself, is it possible that gamers actually are developing superpowers? And I don't mean this trivially. I, I do future forecasting with the Institute for the Future, and we actually have a kind of scientific definition for a superpower. We're not talking about x-ray vision or anything like that. Um, our definition of a superpower is that it's a skill that so far surpasses any previously demonstrated skill that it effectively changes our notion of what is humanly possible. Now, we've had many superpowers in the course of humanity. Language was the first superpower, right? The ability to communicate with other people about bigger ideas. The invention of cities so that we could live together in larger groups. Or the invention of agriculture so that we could feed larger communities. Of course, the design of roads to connect cities or the invention of the internet most recently. All of these superpowers, what they have in common is the ability to connect massively more people so that more of us can come together to do things at a bigger scale. And it looks like these games, games like Angry Birds, which are connecting a billion people, the largest online community, and the largest connected community in the history of humanity, that these platforms could be the next big superpower. So what I want to do is share with you three online game projects, three connected game projects that are kind of harnessing this superpower for good. The first superpower that's really coming into play is the ability to summon crowds out of thin air. Right? That would be a really cool superpower. Now, many of you know the game Farmville, I'm sure. Play it on Facebook most often. Um, and when you play, you get all of these requests from your friends. Would you come feed my chickens in this game? Will you come water my crops? Well, one group of game designers wondered if you could get people to do this in real life. You know, what if you were walking down the street, your mobile phone knows where you are, and it sends you a message just like this. Will you come fertilize my crops? Will you come feed my chickens? But because you're in the real world, it's actually a real community garden. It's a real urban farm. And there's a real chicken that you can feed, or there's a real plant that you can water. And they actually set this up as a game, so sort of real world Farmville. And what they found out is they were able to increase the participation in supporting these community gardens by a factor of 100. Now, I'm sharing this example with you because the outcome is so extraordinary. It really opens your mind about the possibility to get ordinary people involved in real-world work just by adding a game layer. Urban farms, community gardens that had only four volunteers now had a pool of 400 people who were willing to show up and do the work. A factor of 100. It's really extraordinary. All right, the next superpower coming into play is the ability to solve the unsolvable. I've often said that I want gamers or game designers to win a Nobel Prize, I think this is the game that's going to do it. I think this will be the first game that wins a Nobel Prize. It'll be the Nobel Prize in medicine, I'm pretty sure. How many of you have seen this game? Yeah. Um, this is the best example of crowdsourced, cr using games for crowdsourcing anywhere. If you're interested in using crowdsourcing to solve any kind of problem, this is the game to look at. It's called Fold It all one word, it was created by scientists who wanted to take advantage of gamers' spatial skills, their sort of mental ability to move objects in space. I mean, if you've ever played Tetris, you know what I'm talking about, sort of the ability to see how different pieces fit together. This is a very useful scientific skill. It actually turns out that moving things in space to fit together can actually potentially help us cure cancer, 
or stop diseases like Alzheimer's. So the way this game works, this is the interface. It's more complicated than Angry Birds, but it is not more complicated than World of Warcraft, so don't be scared off. You should totally check this out. Um, it teaches you how to fold virtual proteins to make more stable configurations. Now, this is important because unstable configurations lead to disease. And if scientists can figure out new stable configurations, they might be able to create medicines that will help us cure diseases. Um, and the gamers come on, and they move stuff around, and they see how it fits, and they get feedback. Now, the first thing that happened with this game was that in the first year of playing, they had about 50,000 gamers who proved that they were better than computers at this skill. So scientists have been using computers to do this because it's very challenging. And one researcher described it to me as like a Rubik's Cube with 100,000 sides. So if you can imagine trying to solve a Rubik's Cube with 100,000 sides, no individual can do that. They were using computers. But the gamers beat the computers on a test of 10 known protein folding problems within that first year. So the gamers got better than our best supercomputers. So the scientists decided, let's give them a problem we don't know the solution to, see if they can help. That's when we saw headlines like this last fall. When scientists fail, it's time to call in the gamers. Gamers unlock protein mystery that baffled AIDS researchers for years. They gave the gamers a problem that scientists had been working on for 10 years. This problem has to do with stopping the HIV virus from replicating in the body. Scientists had been trying to figure out the protein folding solution to this for 10 years. The gamers solved it successfully in 10 days. Ordinary gamers, 97% of them have no formal education in biochemistry or medicine. 97% of these gamers no formal training. In 10 days, they collectively solved the problem that had stumped real scientists for 10 years. This really shows you the potential power of games to solve extraordinary problems, and that ordinary people do have extraordinary capabilities when we come together and when we have the resilience to stay engaged with these tough problems. The last superpower that I want to talk to you about is the ability to see the future. And this is something I'm particularly interested in, working with the Institute for the Future. So the game I'm going to show you here is actually a game that I helped create called World Without Oil. Now, what we wanted to do is we wanted to figure out what might happen in a peak oil scenario. What if the global demand for oil vastly outpaced the global supply and we had shortages? What would happen? Could we predict that scenario? Now, in most scenario work, the way that futurists do this is they consult experts, people who know a lot about what might happen. We ask them for their expertise, and, and then maybe they're right, maybe they're not. But what we decided might be more useful in this case was to ask a lot of ordinary people what they would do in this situation. Because you might not be an expert on the whole future, but you're a pretty good expert on what you would do in a given situation. You can predict your own behavior pretty effectively, more effectively than some random person who's a so-called expert can predict your behavior. So what we did is we set up this alternate reality forecast. If you signed up to play, we would give you daily updates on this peak oil scenario. We would tell you how much fuel cost. We would tell you where it was available. We might say, for example, that 80% of the people in your city cannot fill up their gas tanks, or food cannot be brought into your town from more than 20 miles away because of a breakdown in the shipping, right? There's not fuel to ship food in from overseas or across state lines. And you would then tell us, how would you get to work? Or how would your employees of your company get to work? What would your company do if suddenly 80% of your employees couldn't show up at the office? If you're a parent, what would you feed your family for dinner if you can't get food from more than 20 miles away? So people told us in blog posts every single day, reacting to new information. This was a soldier who was actually serving in Afghanistan, or serving in Iraq um, at the time. And he blogged every day about what he thought it would be like to wage a war in a world without oil. We had people looking into uh, how you would actually convert your cars and trucks to be biodiesel fueled. He actually went out and found Chinese restaurants where he could get used cooking oil, and that's what he would do if it were a world without oil. People went out and did 
interviews with you know, maybe less gamer types and got their feedback into the game. They made podcasts. They did manga comics, you know, web art. They did real world meetups. They even, you know, started memes to help more people get engaged. By the end of the game, we had more than 100,000 pieces of online content, online forecasts that players had created to help us understand this future. 100,000 stories in six weeks. Uh, by the end of those six weeks, we compiled them into this future forecast called A World Beyond Oil. And this let us look at the collective intelligence from different angles. For example, architecture without oil. We had at the National Convention of Architects that year, they did a session on how you would change building and architecture for a world without oil. We had fellowship without oil. We had pastors and ministers figuring out how could you do church if people couldn't get to church on Sunday? How would you have church? How would you have fellowship? We had people looking at immigration policy without oil, um, PDAs without oil, where, where CEOs trying to figure out how they were going to keep their companies running when people couldn't get to work. Um, two of my favorites were your mama without oil. These were moms thinking about how you would be a good mom in a world without oil. And Zoom Zoom without oil, which were fans of car racing, of auto racing. They were very worried about the future of their sport in a world without oil, so they, they did a lot of thinking about how they could keep NASCAR going. Now, what's interesting about this forecast is if we had asked experts what would happen, we never would have gotten this diversity of thinking. We never would have gotten such personal forecasts, such passionate forecasts about such a diverse range of topics. What was fascinating about the way this project played out, we ran this game for the first time in 2007. A year later, gas prices in the United States hit our forecast. What we had started playing as a fictional scenario became reality a year after we first ran this game. So we were able to compare what players said they would do with what they actually did. We were able to compare our forecast with what actually played out. And it was uncanny. In fact, it was so uncanny, we renamed the game The World Without Oil Early Warning System because it was so accurate. Now, I, I could tell you a lot of examples, but mostly I want to just invite you to come to the game. And you can see the game. It's World Without Oil. It's all archived online. You can go through the game day by day. And you can also visit the blog to see where we tracked the correspondences between reality and the game. So take a look and see how it matched up. I'll give you just a couple examples. Um, um, this was in 2007. Players got interested in housing prices during the game. They got interested because they thought about would people be able to afford to live in the suburbs if they could no longer afford gas to get to the workplace. And as they started looking at housing prices from an oil perspective and then sort of thinking about it more generally, the players predicted a collapse of the real estate market in the United States, um, which actually happened a year later. And we had three players move as a result of playing the game before the housing collapse, actually moved, um, documented, which is fascinating because, first of all, to think that playing a game could change something as profound as you're selling your house and moving is, um, is quite extraordinary. But also, we only had 2,000 players at first run of the game. We've had more than a million since then. But two, three out of 2,000 is uh, statistically quite interesting. We also had gamers beat the experts at predicting where the fail points in public transportation would be. So when this uh, gas crisis actually happened in 2008, there were a lot of shortages on public transportation around the United States. And this created a lot of um, disruption. There was some, even some rioting. And the New York Times that year ran this story where they interviewed the public transportation authorities around these cities like Denver and Atlanta. And they said things like, and I quote directly from the article, nobody could have predicted that people in these cities would want to take public transportation. We have such an ingrained car culture. Nobody would have predicted somebody, so many people would want to take the bus in Denver. Nobody could have predicted that this would happen in Atlanta. Well, we went back and looked at players in Denver and players in Atlanta to see what they had said would happen. And of course, one of the first things they did in the game was to go out, investigate public transportation, and document exactly the fail points that actually came to pass. So nobody could have predicted this future except the players did a year earlier. Ordinary people, not experts. 
So I show you all these examples of getting people engaged with real-world action, you know, real-world service, of solving really tough problems, some of the pro toughest problems we're facing as a planet, of even being able to accurately predict the future so that we can innovate now to avoid futures we don't want. These are all possibilities that are available to you, and all you have to do is figure out how to engage these one billion gamers. That number will certainly double or triple in the next decade. You will have access to an extraordinary number of people who have changed the way they think and act to be creative and resilient and determined and optimistic in the face of very tough challenges. And I hope that you take advantage of these gamers to help you solve the toughest problems that you're facing and to innovate some extraordinary things. And now I think we're going to take a few questions from that cool balloon game that you guys are playing. Is that right? Yes. Great. Thank you very much.